And <laughs> whenever I do stuff, I'm like, oh crap, that wasn't a crazy CEO thing, was it? Like, did I, and I kind of play it back in my head. And I can tell you that I still like almost daily look at certain decisions or interactions through the lens of don't be the crazy CEO. Mm -hmm. Because I saw enough of them and thought to myself, like, why are people like that? Like, why is that happening? I don't want to be dictatorial. I don't want the company to think this is the Bart Davis show. This like, is about all of us and how we all are successful. And it needs to be more than me or else it'll stink. <laughs>about this conversation today. I love having the conversations with entrepreneurs who are really self-reflective about the different sides of us that help grow and scale businesses. So today I have Bart on with us and he is a part of a community that I'm also a part of, the Entrepreneurs Organization, and something they do really well is scale trust. And in that community, it's also very much about identifying the problems inside of our businesses and then diving so much deeper into the shadow things that we're doing as leaders that are hurting our organizations, whether it is driving revenue or duplicating ourselves or delegating or developing team. And so Bart, I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. I know that you have recently made some big transitions within your organization to get to certain levels. And I'm curious how the relationship inside of yourself, like the alpha side of you that's hard charging and the empathy side of you that is maybe wants to take everybody along with you have been integrated to scale. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy, I guess. I think a lot of us who make the decision to, you know, to start and run and scale a business, obviously there, it takes some confidence and it takes, I think, a certain type of personality that to your point, maybe doesn't always jive with sort of the empathetic side of things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a learning as you go, how to merge those and how to be balanced between, um, between those kind of two sides of you. And so I think I'm, I'm, my goal is to always be improving in that. And I know I'm, I know I'm not where I need to be, but hopefully I'm moving in the right direction. I don't know if we ever really arrive. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I just want to get there. And then when I get to wherever I think I'm getting, it's like, oh, wow, now I see further and I see how far I have to go. But your point about entrepreneurs, the thing about us, I, I kind of think of us as athletes. Like professional athletes have that, that factor that makes them sometimes challenging to interact with, but it also makes them so magnetic and high achievers and make big things happen. So in your journey of learning how to get the part of you that performs well to keep performing well, and then the part of you that needs to rally people and develop playbooks and get everybody else on board with the mission, when did you realize that you needed to integrate those two parts? And what's your natural leaning? Are you naturally more alpha or naturally more empathy? Yeah, I would say I'm naturally more alpha. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I think I had a few kind of helpful learnings pre, you know, pre entrepreneurship. It's just as far as managing people and teams to where it took me a little while to realize that because I have always been so like career oriented and I want the next thing and I want to do better and bigger. I just kind of assumed that everybody felt that way. And so at one point in time, I had someone on my team who was just an absolute rock star accountant. And therefore, my assumption was they want to be a rock star controller or CFO or, you know, just again, kind of keep that progression okay. moving. And so I brought that to them thinking they'd be so excited. And it was like, well, I think I'm good, like doing what I'm doing. And it like blew my mind. I didn't understand you know, why when presented with an opportunity to do bigger, more, whatever, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be to jump at that. And mm -hmm. so that was like a, that was a big learning that kind of like made me realize that, you know, you can't, not everyone has the same lens. Not everyone has the same view in their mind of what success is for them. And I think that that, that's something I think back about a lot as far as then how to go and manage other people and think about what their goals are and, 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 how the team as a whole can help achieve maybe a different set of goals. 
I have had that ex exact same experience where I'm like, what? there's so much opportunity. Why would you not want to do it? And some people are really very, very content with just putting, just doing, living in their current zone of genius and having a lifestyle that allows them to not take a lot of their work home with them, to be more present in moments and to grow in their maybe 1% way that they choose to do it, which is totally okay. And there's nothing wrong with it. And it's took me a while to accept that my wiring isn't everybody's wiring. And that's even impacted trainings that I've created because I've thought, oh, well, if I create the training like this, it's pretty obvious what needs to happen. And when I realize that people do not have that same lens, it's, it, I have to slow down my alpha and let my empathy come in to really connect with the team and, and people around me in ways that really meet them where they're at. Have you found that same journey as well in scaling your business? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, on, on that, on the people different having, you know, people having their own goals and visions of success. And, and I like what you said, like they're living in their own genius. I feel like it's been like a learned skill or learned behavior to, to try to identify those things and to, and to let people thrive in that, even if it's not, again, the way that, that I would thrive or how hard I would charge or whatever. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, again, I don't, I don't think I'm there. I don't think I, I wouldn't call myself good at that stuff, but I know that I'm better. And I think that I know how to you know, how to try to keep improving. So I, you know, again, I feel, I feel like if, if I'm, as long as I am aware of the fact that it's a weakness, that, that hopefully that means I can slowly improve at it. Sure. I think society, you know, like the hustle culture and everything makes being alpha feel bad, but I have found that my alpha has generated a lot of amazing results in my life. And also, I have found my empathy has also created a lot of results in my life. I don't think it's, if we're 100% empathetic, then we're 100% giving all of the time and we can become a doormat. So how has your alpha been really advantageous for you? You know, I think, and, and I'm, I might be equating alpha and confidence a little bit too much, but, you know, I, I think just again, and this, this predates starting a company, but I, I have always felt like there's no reason for me to not go after the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so if the next thing was a promotion or if the next thing was sign a new client, or if the next thing was eventually start a business, you know, the, the, there's very little kind of chatter in my head to say, don't, or, or mm -hmm. what if I can't, or, th you know, of course I might, I might fail at it, but I guess maybe it's a, Maybe it's a comfort level with that that has that that I feel like is a big a big part of this, and so so yeah I I, I think and again may, maybe alpha and and confidence maybe I'm interlinking too much but but I feel like that is a big part of all, all of the decisions that have you know eventually led to to running this business. Mm -hmm. I I kind of think of my alpha as my doer, and I think of my empathy as my dreamer. Sure. Like I dream of a way that I could be of service to people, that I could be of service to myself, my team, whether, you know, what product I could put out in the marketplace that would be of value. And then I would get, would be able to get monetization from. And then I think of my alpha as the person that actually goes and makes it happen. So when did you realize, because you, you referenced a few times that, well, this was before I became an entrepreneur. So when did you realize that you had the stomach to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, so it's, it's funny. So I, so I have um, been working in, in kind of entrepreneur-led companies for a <laughs> long time, since 2014, and, and alongside kind of a, a career serial entrepreneur and, and a guy named Joel Trammell who's been, who's been running businesses in Austin for about as long as I've been alive. And I, I remember early on in that being like, I would never do this because mm -hmm. there are so many things that can go wrong, you know, whether it be like not having the right systems, not setting the systems up correctly, not 
being, you know, not not being registered in the in states correctly, or I mean, myriad things, right? Yes. And but then at some point, two two things I think led to that change. One is one is that I just realized that what we were doing as a team for these companies was of significant value, and so that gave me confidence to th that we would figure some of the other things out. And then mm -hmm. the other was realizing that simply the awareness that all of those tripwires, so to speak, existed was kind of an advantage. I think a lot of people have a product, an idea, a service that, and, and, and go. And I had that and also some awareness about like kind of possible failure modes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and that while originally that scared the crap out of me later on, it wound up giving me some confidence that, you know, I, I'm surrounding myself with people who know how to deal with some of these things. And, mm -hmm. and so we'll be okay. You know, mm -hmm. you said you made the comment that you never thought you would be an entrepreneur. And I have looked back at my life and I've said things like, oh, I would never do that. Or I'd never do this. And then I find myself doing it. And it's kind of giving ourselves permission to change our mind. And so that's a really beautiful relationship with yourself because you're giving yourself permission to reinvent yourself and how was that journey for your your head your heart your soul your relationships i mean it's a shift yeah it's definitely a shift yeah so i, I mean it's like a quick step back like I, i'm an accountant by uh degree in nature i guess so mm -hmm. i you know i would generally call myself risk averse and, and coming out of school and going into like big four public accounting, there's a very specific ladder for lack mm -hmm. of a better word that's out there for you. And so that, and that gave me an immense amount of comfort coming out of school. And, and, and again, I think it's part of the, like, I would never do that. I've got this, like, I, I just, I do this, I do these things. I follow these steps. I get the CPA and so on and so forth. And then, yeah, I think they're just, they're, they're the combination of realization that we were doing really high quality work that, that, you know, early to mid stage companies needed. And, and, and I, and I think I also my my definition of risk shifted. So it went from like, like I saw the opportunity and that outweighed, you know, what, what I would have called like, again, you know, kind of a, a, a scary, a big risk earlier, earlier in my career and earlier in my, I guess, as you would put it, maybe relationship with myself. So yeah, it was an interesting, interesting realization that I was okay with it. I think I kind of surprised myself with that, like with being not, not only like okay with it, but being like really eager to go do that. And it's been, I mean, it's been so much fun. I've had an absolute blast despite how stressful it is at times. Like I've absolutely loved it. So is it, how did, in what ways did it surprise you? What, what do you mean? The, the, the decision or the, how, the enjoyment or the enjoyment because there's a part of you that was like i would never do that there's so many things that could go wrong i don't want to fail to wow like we're actually doing really good quality work for people i could be of more value if i leaned into being an entrepreneur although i told myself i would never do it it feels yeah. scary like you surprised you but then the journey surprised you yeah yeah, true. Yeah, both. And I think so like the part, the enjoyment part, again, kind of getting back to, you know, who I was or what what I did, at least earlier in my career, like it was very structured, it was very regimented, it was, and I, and I felt comfortable in that. And now, as I'm sure you can relate, like no two days look or feel the same ever. And that is awesome. Like, I didn't think it was going to be awesome, but it is. And you know, now I would, I would pseudo consider myself a sales guy, which I think would have been like terrified to, or like almost, not terrified. I think I might've been like grossed out to say that five <laughs> years ago, you know, like sales. Oh, like they just like, they just, they're all on top of you. They don't, they give you stuff you don't want or need. And like, now I have a different relationship with what I think yeah. sales is and the value that it creates. And it's just, a, it's yeah. such a funny evolution that, that, yeah, that I've just really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Two things that I feel like if we dive even deeper than what you just shared, I feel like my journey has been similar in the fact that I've surprised me. And when that takes place, it's kind of a shift in my identity because there's a part of me that shifts and realizes, oh, I'm more capable than I thought I was. And my failures don't mean I'm a mistake. My failures don't mean I did something wrong. And then when I have to make that, sh when I redefine my identity, 
and then embrace the journey because the journey is the same. The experience is really different. You know, we, we make revenue, we lose money, we hire a team, team leaves. We do think it's the same for every business. Sure. And it's the leadership of what we associate to the actions that really change our organization. So there's storytelling that we do to ourselves. Are you like, are you aware of that whole part inside of yourself that is transpiring? And if you are, are you just kind of going with the flow or dissecting it? Because you're in, you're, you're analytical. I mean, by nature. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely not dissecting it. I okay. can tell you that because I think I don't know if I would ever calm down or sleep if I was if I was really you know what I mean delving into yeah. into that in my in my own brain. It's funny to hear you describe it as like storytelling to yourself. I don't think I would have I wouldn't have framed it that way, but I totally understand what you're mm-hmm. saying. And the, I think the the person who I I think I did that to, and and it was I guess I didn't do it to myself. I I did it to my wife during the decision making process of you know going from working for four small businesses to being a small business, I guess. I think I told her every day that I had a new decision about, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm going to go work for this company. I'm going to go work for that company. Oh, there's this entrepreneurial thing I could do. No, I'm not going to do that. And I, I thank God I, I, I drove her nuts, I'm sure. But I guess that was to keep, you know, so that I wasn't doing it all in my head. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, man, she was so relieved. Like, I don't think he even cared what the outcome was, but just that I was going to stop changing my mind every day mm. uh, with, you know, with the decision to, to launch 512 Financial mm. was, uh, yeah, I think probably like a watershed moment for her probably more than myself. But but yeah, now that you hearing it framed as the storytelling to yourself, I, I think back about that quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I think you're on the natural journey of an entrepreneur. You're figuring out what problem you can solve in the marketplace, what unique value you can bring. Do you even want to do that? Because you could do it, but it could not be energizing. And it could sacrifice your health, your relationships, your sanity. So much could be at risk. And so I think there is a natural wrestling in the beginning of, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? Especially for folks who are more wired analytically. Your wife must be an angel though, because it is not easy. Like her being able to keep her nervous system stable while you are changing your mind every single day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would, I don't, I would not have handled that well if you, if you reverse <laughs> the roles, I can tell you that for sure. Yeah. So when, so you launch 512 Financial, scale it quickly because you scaled it two, three years, right? We've, we've been in business for less than two and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. So you scaled it really quickly. And do you, what did that journey look like? Did you feel like you went all alpha just to get it off the ground and then flew back into like, we need to recalibrate? Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if you've ever, I think of, so it's, it's still so short, so I'm not trying to pretend like I've, you know, even close to got it figured out. If you've read the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by so Andreessen Horowitz guys, one of the things that I think about a lot that's in there is that like the wartime CEO and peacetime CEO. Mm-hmm. So 2022, like, which was, which was our first, you know, full year of operating, like things just went really well. Market was strong for what we were doing. People were hitting me up all the time. Like we weren't doing anything outbound. People were just, you know, LinkedIn, email, whatever. Hey, I need your help with this. We, yeah, sure, I'll let me hire so that we can help you. And I would say I was like very kind of alpha in, in, in that year. And then 2023, you know, was much more challenging, at least for us and for our clientele, which is predominantly tech technology companies. And so I felt like I... I, I had to be sort of more wartime CEO. I had to, you know, manage what that was going to mean for the business. We can't just be, um, I can't, you know, I, I have to, I have to be cognizant of what the difficulty means for our people, but I also have to be cognizant of what these difficulties mean for our clients, some of whom are having to let, you know, let, let people go and what that means for our contract. I mean, all, all right. of it. And so I would say like, even though I don't think it suited me very well, I think that I went from like peacetime to wartime. And I think that I went from alpha to, to empathy a little bit between from 22 to 23. And then 
hopefully 24 will, will be a, a better kind of meld of, of all of that. But I guess we'll find out. Yeah, to integrate the both of them. Yeah. What's beautiful, though, is that you have the range. The range to be able to go hard charging and show up for the task at hand, and then also to pull back and be empathetic. You have the range, and that that gives us the tools to be able to be more integrated. And the humility also to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm still figuring it out. I'm getting a little bit better each day. I'm tweaking it. And I think that truly is the journey. Are you a solo founder or do you have a business partner? Yeah, I've got a business partner. So I mentioned his name earlier, Joel Trammell. So he, when I first came, I moved to Austin in 2014. I worked for him directly and we were doing what we do now for a couple of his portfolio companies that he was the lead investor and board chairman in. Mm -hmm. And, and he was instrumental, like along the way in some of those, some of the kind of development areas that I described, like in, in, in for one, and he, every six months, probably he had a, what do you want to, he asked me what I want to be when I grow up. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number, just like that conversation with my wife, like the number of times that that answer changed was you know, <laughs> pretty much every time. I don't know that any of the times that I say, like, I want to run my own business, you know, but, but there was, I want to be CFO. I want to be a CEO. I want to, you know, like, like the size of the company, all, all those things kind of went all over the place. But anyway, so, so to answer your question more directly, he is my co-founder. He is, you know, not, he's got a lot of irons in the fire still, so he's not heavily involved day to day, but I mean, unbelievable resource to have at my disposal from a experience and exposure standpoint, you know, his, his name carries a lot of weight in the, in the Austin technology industry. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been a, a really a, a joy, frankly, to, to, to run the business with him. So if you were to look at your accountability chart, who is the visionary and who is the integrator? So I would say I'm it's very funny to call myself a visionary because I, I don't generally. <laughs> You're still figuring it out. You change your mind every day. I think, I, think I'm, I think I am the visionary of the business. I think actually our director of operations is the closest thing to an integrator. We're not like really sure. traction, rocket fuel focused, but, but, but yeah, she, she would be the closest to our, to our integrator. So I am curious about your transition or transformation because you go from being an individual contributor to probably running a small team to then up leveling your director of operations and going to, through the transition of really owning the visionary seat, which tends to be when people go through that transition, they could be labeled as control freaks or micromanagers because they want to know everything that's going on. And there's a letting go process, but, but also a process of developing trust, two ways trust, and also developing confidence between all of the individual contributors. So how did that transition go for you from being kind of COO to CEO? Yeah. So I, 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 was in a really lucky place where my role from let's say 2014 to 2021 allowed me exposure to a lot of CEOs and C a lot of C-suite folks in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got to sort of pick and choose things that I liked about how certain people did things and how I didn't like that certain people did things. And I can tell you that I still like almost daily look at certain decisions or interactions through the lens of like, don't be the crazy CEO mm -hmm. because I saw enough of them and thought to myself, like, why are people like that? Like what, what, why is that happening? And mm -hmm. so whenever I do stuff, I'm like, oh crap, that wasn't a crazy CEO thing. Was it like, did I, and I kind of play it back in my head. And, and so I, so I think that those, all of those interactions over those seven years, I think is kind of what prepared me to A, start to take on more of the visionary role, B, put the director of operations into a place where I felt like I had been at times, and then, you know, treat that person and the other people on my team, like the way that I enjoyed being treated by some or the opposite of how I didn't from others. Mm -hmm. So I love that you had all of the experience and insights from watching CEOs. I think there's so much value 
in seeing people do it well and then seeing people struggle with it. And I have been crazy CEO. I have been disciplined CEO. I've watched other people do the exact same things and undermine their businesses over and over again, and then also empower them and also recover. I've seen crazy CEOs turn it around and become disciplined CEOs. So for whoever's listening, if you feel like you're a crazy CEO or a disciplined CEO or anything in between, we, we can change our minds. We can do it differently starting today and it can look very different. So, but I'm curious, Bart, from your perspective, since you so, witnessed so much, what are, would you say are the top traits that you try to embody and which ones do you try to avoid like the plague? Yeah, I would, so I would say the ones that I try to embody, you know, you mentioned humility. I, I try to, you know, I, I make fun of myself. I recognize that there's some things I'm good at and some things I'm not. And I don't, I try not to shy away from that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I try to be decisive without being dictatorial, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. I think a thing that can really hamstring a business is, is indecision. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to make choices. I'm probably going to make some wrong ones. And then to your point, hopefully on the wrong ones, I can recover from them. But mm -hmm. I, I prefer that to standing still mm -hmm. and getting back to the whole topic of the empathetic versus alpha. Like I recognize the need to relate to people and I, and I enjoy it, even though it's like, it, it feels secondary at times. Like I know how important it is and I genuinely enjoy it. It's just like, you have to remind yourself to do it sometimes because there's so mm -hmm. much going on. So, so yeah, those are the things I kind of try to emphasize or embody. Mm -hmm. And then I guess you really invert those things for what I try to avoid. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be wishy-washy on my decisions. I don't want, I don't want to be dictatorial. I don't want the company to think this is the Bart Davis show. Like this is about all of us and how we all are successful and, and it needs to be more than me or else it'll stink. And then I think, I think the other one that I really, really try to embody that, that I think comes from seeing it in practice and, and attempting it and failing is transparency. Like transparency doesn't mean that you tell everyone everything all the time, but you share what you can and you share things that are relevant and important and, you know, without, without freaking people out, which is, a, mm -hmm. which is kind of a delicate balance sometimes, I think. Mm hmm One word that I feel like encompasses a lot of what you're saying is to be authentic. Just yes. to just to show up saying, this is our vision, mission, values. This is what we're trying to achieve. I'd love to take everybody with me. We're probably going to get some holes in our boats at times. Sometimes we're going to be rowing not in the same direction. We're going to have to have some tough conversations. But we're just going to sit in the boat, patch our holes, row in the same direction, and figure it out. It's speed of the leader. And I, I'm curious your take on that those ter that term or that motto, speed of the leader, I've been reflecting on it lately because speed of the leader means the pace that the leader sets, the organization goes. And sometimes when I used to hear that, I thought it meant put more gas, like just speed of the leader, like <laughs> pedal to the metal, let's go. And now I'm realizing that that may not be the entirety of that statement. It could be that we do need to have pit stops and we do need to have maintenance and we do need to have things that are a little bit more integrated for the whole, for the long-term journey of it. How do you as a leader figure out that pace? Yeah, I think another kind of angle on the speed thing is... is um urgency. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there are times that I work with a great deal of urgency and then others that I try to like make note of the fact that although I, I could go do it right now, it's not the thing that's going to, you know, move the needle the most. It's not, it's, I think it's like the Eisenhower matrix, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of the four box window of like urgent and important, urgent, but not important, uh, important, but not urgent. And not important and not urgent. Mm -hmm. And it's like so simple, but you put, if I try to put things through that lens and that dictates a combination of urgency and speed. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I hadn't heard that term speed of the leader. I, I, it makes sense to me though. And how, how important that is to, to kind of figure out like, what's the, what's the pace of the engine, so to speak for, for the company. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I think I, I, I try to think of it more as like what, what isn't, isn't urgent and apply, I guess, pressure or speed based on that. Do you tend to be more gas 
I mean, alpha, I feel like tends to be more gas. So. Yeah. I think that's my natural inclination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's typical. So most of the visionaries and CEOs that I interact with, they're all gas. And then I work with their integrators to set pace. Because, and so like your director of operations, I'm curious her, his or her role in helping you not go too fast or encouraging you to take a little portion of the road slower or a portion of the journey faster. Is there that dynamic between the two of you? Yeah, very much so. I think she, so she's very... So I guess one step back, like the, the, the original purpose for bringing her in is, you know, almost everyone in the business is client facing revenue producing, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be tough to be in that mode, like all the time and not have someone or people who are, who are focused on like optimizing processes, improving training and onboarding and all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. So that was her original, that was why we brought her in, in the first place. And then it became apparent that she was like, so such a problem solver. And so, so she kind of naturally fell into that integrator role. And mm -hmm. there's definitely push pull between us, which I think is healthy on, on some combination of pace, speed, importance, mm -hmm. who should do what, like, I think another part of the alpha thing at times, you mentioned it being the doer is like, well, F it, like, I'm just going to get this done, you know, and, but that's not necessarily the best and most important use of, of my time. And she's helpful at saying, you know, like, A, I could do it. B, I could assign it to someone else. And, you know, whereas without that kind of logical person evaluating all of the internal things, I, I might just go run off and do some stupid, crazy CEO harebrained stuff, right? <laughs> you might be crazy CEO. <laughs> I might be crazy CEO. And I still, maybe I am, but she's helping me not be for sure. I feel like that integ the integrator role cr creates so much steadiness in an organization. And it it's almost, I did not one of our first episodes, we talked about with this integrator and we jokingly said that the integrator's job is to manage everyone's nervous system. Like you manage the team's nervous system, you manage the visionary's nervous system, you manage the nervous system of the, the tech system. Like everything's got to be dialed in and sync. Otherwise it goes off the rails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, <clears throat> So what are some of your projects that you have coming up that you're excited about? So we, there's two things, I think. Well, one that's just kind of getting off the ground, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of a quality of earnings. It's a term thrown around a lot in when, when companies are getting acquired. And so that's something that we have kind of recently, we've, we've only done a handful of them, but we're, we're kind of scaling up, scaling up that, that function, I guess, and kind of bringing a, a side, a, like it's, it's, it's very related to what our like bread and butter business is, but it's different. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're trying to get that process humming. So I'm excited about that. Have um, you guys seen a lot more acquisitions happening? No, no. I think the, the volume is similar. I think with how difficult 2023 was for some companies, maybe timelines shifted a little for mm -hmm. some of those companies or the investors of those companies. But the deal volume isn't radically different, I don't think. But I think just as a as our name has become a little bit more well known in Austin, just naturally some some additional things have been asked of us that included. And we had a guy, we have a guy who helped scale up what's what's called a transaction advisory practice in Houston, and so he's he's kind of helping us do that now here. So we're excited about that. And then our, our fractional CMO practice is eight, eight months old and it's really starting to, to gain some traction now as well. And so, yeah, we're just, just trying to, you know, to continue to hone in, do more of what we're good at and then improve on the things that we're not. And so, yeah, I think, I think we're seeing the, the fruits of, of that labor in our fractional CMO practice and in the Q of E practice as well. So your 512 Financial started off as just a CPA firm, right? Sort of. We, we were a team of CPAs. So a CPA firm, there's some weird rules um, okay. about, about that. But yeah, so we started off as, I'll say, an accounting services firm. And so all these things, they're all like related. So yeah, so we started off as pretty much exclusively fractional accounting and finance, very quickly added fractional HR, 
about a year later, added fractional marketing and then have been kind of folding in this Q of E concept six months or so. Have you been seeing kind of the fractional model take off? I think so. I think that we got really lucky with the timing of starting the business overall, where that was already starting and we just did the part of it that we knew. But it's, I mean, to me, it's, of course, I, I'm on my soapbox, but it's so logical to me to have this concept where for some of these, for, for companies that are, you know, let's say a million to 15 million or something like that in, in revenue, where typically companies that size are not going to have the resources to have like really experts in finance, marketing, whatever, like certainly very high quality people, but like it's expensive to have experts in those things. Mm -hmm. And so to get them for 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week or whatever, mm -hmm. just makes so much sense. And then you can, you know, you can hire people to, to scale up with them mm -hmm. and, and execute on the vision and the strategy of, of a marketing expert or a CFO or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I think it was already starting to become more popular 2021, 2022. And I, and I, it feels like that has, um, has continued to take off. And then in, in more areas than we kind of realized starting out with accounting and finance only. So scaling the fractional model, have you run into, have you ran into probably different roadblocks than maybe a non-fractional model? And I'm curious the impact on like resource management capacity, middle management type thing. You, you guys probably spent, invested quite a bit of time figuring out the organizational structure for that model. Yeah. I mean, so Joel told the first, you know, on day one, he's like, this, you will always have this problem. You know, you're either going to have too much work and not enough people to do it or too many people and not enough work to do. Like that is just mm -hmm. the nature of this beast. And mm -hmm. And so we're doing everything to your point that we can to optimize that, but it's never going to be perfect. People are either going to be really busy or not busy enough. And, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be margin swings according to that. But, but yeah, so, so, you know, it started off, everyone reported to me and then, and then we kind of built some tiers in between for who, you know, to optimize how those people are supported and to make it that I'm not a bottleneck for everyone. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, you know, still doing our best to make that better. But I think mm -hmm. we definitely have spent a lot of time thinking about that and doing our best to, to optimize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a couple more questions. How would you define success? So something that I think gets talked about a lot in like the EO type circles, you know, I just fell into the trap myself of like, you know, bundling companies based on their revenue, right? <laughs> So there's the, the, the saying around EO circles is revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think if you had asked me that question a while ago, I would say, oh, like we have to be 10 million in revenue and doing this and that. And, and now I'm really, you know, I, I have seen and realized like 10 million in revenue doesn't necessarily mean anything, of course, depending on what your expenses are. And, and then, and then depending on how, you know, how your people are doing. And so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that success is, I think success is fulfillment. And so some people like they're fulfilled because they made a lot of money and some people are fulfilled because they experienced some cool things. And to our point earlier about what, you know, my motivation versus someone else is being different. Like, I think it's, I think it's just has to be really broad because my definition will not be the same as my 30 people. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, I have to celebrate a, a wide variety of successful things. So I will celebrate when we have new customers and more revenue and all those things. But I also celebrate that in two years, we've only had one person leave the company. Like that's mm -hmm. a huge success to me, mm -hmm. you know, voluntarily leave. Like, I don't know. I don't have any metrics. I don't know how to compare that or like say that I stack up, we stack up against other businesses in any certain way, but that feels like a success to me. And so, mm -hmm. and again, we, and so we celebrate that internally. So, so yeah, I guess success means lots of things. I don't have, I don't, and I won't, I don't think have one definition anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like the one word that sums it all up is fulfillment. It's fulfilling to you to have 
you know, the profit margin you want. It's fulfilling to you to have the type of team and culture environment that you have. Those things all fulfill you. And based on that fulfillment, you feel successful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Adequate. So people... that, was, that was well, <laughs> well, <perfect. laughs> well, it's what you said. Uh, so if people want to, <laughs> Dang, I'm good, man, I'm yeah, good. You are good. <laughs> if people want to connect with you, where could they find you? Yes, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You know, we're a, we're a B2B business. So our, all the, the majority of our still somewhat nominal marketing efforts occur there. I'm on it a lot. You can find my email on our website along with, with lots of good info. But yeah, so I'd say like LinkedIn and LinkedIn and our website are, are the place to, to A, get a hold of me and B, find out info about the business. Okay, awesome. So that's Bart Davis on LinkedIn and 512financial.com. Awesome. That is correct. It was a pleasure chatting with you about your journey into entrepreneurship, how you've integrated your alpha and your empathy, how you're owning your not crazy CEO seat <laughs> and making some big things happen. So thank you for being on. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Stacey. It was, it was, it was a pleasure to, to speak with you today for sure. Yes.